member of his gang at the intersection of Route 114 and Dove Road near Grapevine, Texas on Easter Sunday. Unbeknownst to Bonnie and Clyde, six officers, led by Texas Ranger and all-around dude not to be fucking trifled with, Frank Hamer, a man who'd been tracking the pair relentlessly for weeks, were hiding behind some bushes on the side of the road, ready to ambush the pair. And when they heard that Ford's big V8 revving towards them, the lawmen didn't ask the two to pull over. They opened fire. They filled that Ford full of 167 rounds of ammunition pouring out of the Remington Model 8 and Browning automatic rifles. They had zero interest in bringing them in alive. And they were far from alive when the shooting stopped. The coroner's report listed Clyde being hit by 17 bullets and Bonnie getting 26 pieces of lead in hers. How did their lives get to the point where the law wanted them that dead. Find out in this ill-fated lover's gangster edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, everybody. I'm Dan Cummins, and thanks for listening to Time Suck. Got some fun news today. Uh, The video version of my last stand-up record, Don't Wake the Bear, is now on Amazon Video. You can watch it for free on Amazon Prime if you'd like. Uh, I didn't even know that until some of you fans started messaging me because the record label that produced it is a fucking joke. And they're terrible and they tell me nothing. Uh, Thank God I'm no longer with them going forward. But I am happy uh, with how the special turned out. And I'm glad you can watch it now. And I'm glad you can watch it for free if you got got Prime. So that's that. And uh, yeah, that's exciting for me. Uh, thank you to all you suckheads, all you time suckers for all the iTunes reviews, uh, this past week. Uh, thanks for all the good feedback about JFK, uh, the subscriptions, recommendations for others to listen in, uh, to listen. Uh, appreciate you guys spreading the suck very much, man. And the suck is spreading. It's growing every week. All thanks to you guys. Uh, thanks for clicking on that Amazon button at timesuckpodcast.com to do your Amazon shopping. Uh, thanks to those of you who throw some, threw some bucks to the suck this past week, uh, hitting that donation button at timesuckpodcast.com and, uh, all going to good stuff. And, and, of course, thanks to uh, the Time Suckers who bought that uh, Bengal Tiger Hide Time Suck t-shirt uh, this past week. Uh, both the first and second generation Bengal Hide uh, t-shirts. Uh, I hear they, uh, they give you unlimited astral projection ability the first 60 days you wear them, and then limited uh, astral projection uh, there on after that. Uh, you can see some pics of Time Suckers wearing these at Dan Cummins uh, Comedy on Instagram. That's at Dan Cummins Comedy on Instagram. Uh, the third Time Suck tee isn't quite here. Uh, we, we had some, some technical difficulties getting the things coordinated for printing, but that's all right. That's all right. It's at the printers now should be in the store very, very soon. What, what is in the store right now? Do you got some new stuff? Uh, I got some signed copies of my don't wake the bear album and also some signed copies, uh, of my very adult, uh, fake kids book called daddy bear and three rabbits meet the real world. And if you heard that track off of don't wake the bear, uh, and, and you didn't know, I, I had the book, uh, illustrated like a graphic novel. <laughs> I'm so happy with how it came out. And I have, uh, Copies autographed specifically to Time Suckers uh, up at timesuckpodcast.com. And there's also going to be pictures, uh, you know, from today's episode at the website as well, as always. And finally, a uh, big thanks to Time Sucker Nicholas J.Q. Dunsmore for suggesting this particular topic a long time ago. And uh, and let's get into it. Let's get into it right after a few Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. Oh, the nuclear debate. The old nuclear pronunciation debate. A lot of time suckers wrote in over my pronunciation of the word nuclear uh, in the JFK episodes. And you know what? It's time we have a talk. It's time we have a talk. Uh, This was brought up before. Uh, I tried to change and say nuclear, uh, but then I did some research and realized I don't have to change. Ah, turns out there are two acceptable ways to pronounce nuclear. Some people, including some very prominent people, uh, incorrectly on a, on a, uh, the original technical level, say nuclear uh, or nuclear. <laughs> this is another way they have it written out, but nuclear is the mispronunciation. Uh, this pronunci- uh, mispronunciation is so common, it's found its way into popular culture, like in 1989, uh, the Woody Allen film Crimes and Misdemeanors, uh, Mia Farrow's character says she would not fall in love with the man who pronounced the word nuclear. Uh, another version of this is nu- nuclear. Nuclear. There we go. Just a slight, slight variation. Well, President George W. Bush, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Bill Clinton have pronounced the word this way in the past. President Jimmy Carter said nuclear. Uh, Homer Simpson still says nuclear. Uh, American dictionaries now recognize nuclear as an accepted variant of the word. Uh, they do say that people might be confusing the word with words like circular and secular. Uh, at least one book attempted to argue that the presidential versions are actually correct and that weapons labs since uh, World War II used nuclear as a pronunciation. Um, it's not a settled issue. Uh, so if you want to be safe, uh, they do say, say, new 
clear, nuclear. Uh, I just don't like it that way. Uh, we, we do not list, uh, this is what Merriam Webster says. They say, uh, we do not list the pronunciation of nuclear as acceptable. We merely list it as a commonly used pronunciation. This pronunciation is preceded by the obelisk mark. Uh, it's like a little division mark. Uh, this mark indicates a pronunciation variant that occurs in educated speech, but that is considered by some to be questionable or unacceptable. Uh, we are definitely not advocating that anyone should use those pronunciations or that they should abandon the others as they are regarded as more acceptable. But here's the deal. Uh, so while nuclear is the proper, undisputably uh, correct pronunciation of the world, nuclear uh, has been used so often, it's forced its way into acknowledgement by the pronunciation police as an acceptable alternate pronunciation of the world. And I like the way it rolls off the tongue. We also have to account for uh, regional dialects. I have kind of like a rednecky accent at times, and it's, it's from where I grew up in a small town in Riggins. It's almost southern in nature. It's like a rural accent, and uh, it is what it is. And I like nuclear. I like the way it rolls off the tongue. I'm never going to sound like Tom Brokaw. Never going to be up here uh, going, very popular, uh, a very proper uh, uh, speaking member of the media. Uh, we will say things uh, in a uh, sanitized, uh, perfectly acceptable way. Uh, I like sometimes uh, using the alternate pronunciations. Uh, a little more, a uh, little more blue collar feels a little more, a little more genuine to me. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to continue to say <laughs> nuclear. So fucking get over it. Uh, I'm going to add to its takeover of the original pronunciation. I'm going to say it so goddamn much. Uh, I hope that so many others end up saying it like I do. And then someday Merriam Webster recognizes as, as the actual proper way to say the word. And if you don't like that, you can go suck yourself. All right. But seriously, uh, pronunciation for a lot of words, uh, you know, they change over time, depending on common usage. It's not like some word god uh, made all of our words in a divine word factory, and they were to remain untouched forever. You know, this must not be altered. Uh, actually, word god, we're now pronouncing it as altered. Motherfucker! Okay, so that's that. So nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. <laughs> I hope it drives you crazy. Michael McDonald update. Uh, yep. Time suckers Scott Long and Brandon Thomas let me know that Michael McDonald and Kenny Loggins, who I both mentioned several times, were on this night show uh, with that funk bass maestro Thundercat just the other day on June 5th. Uh, I watched them sing a show you the way. It was super weird, uh, super funky, beautiful, and fucking glorious. They still got it. They still got it. Uh, and finally, uh, one more uh, quick little uh, time sucker update. Suckhead Adam Griffin wrote in regarding uh, me referring to a whale as Mocha Dick in the shark episode saying, Damn, what the fuck? Mocha Dick? I think it's Moby, Moby Dick. LOL. Well, uh, just in case anyone else is confused, I did say it was Moby Dick uh, when I was referring to the fisherman-hating whale uh, written about in Herman Melville's classic tale of the same name, Moby Dick. However, just to be clear to anyone else who thought I misspoke, uh, Moby Dick is in fact partially based upon tales of an albino sperm whale that was called Mocha Dick, uh, reportedly destroyed 20 whaling ships off the coast of Argentina around Mocha Island in the early 19th century. So old chocolate coffee dick was a real creature and not just a sugary caffeinated chocolate penis that I uh, Freudianly inserted <laughs> And that's all the updates uh, I got for this week. Uh, I know many more of you sent some stuff in. I'll get to as much of it as I can going forward. But we got we got a lot of uh, Bonnie and Clyde to get to today. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Bonnie and Clyde. Lovers. Gangsters. Folk heroes. Ninjas. Puppeteers. Hummel figurine collectors. Bird watchers. Anthropologists. Okay, only those first three are true, but the last five were fun to say. Uh, I think you know, if you've already listened to a few episodes of This Suck, uh, that this episode is going to call for a big timeline. Big Time Suck timeline. A dual Time Suck timeline. So let's take a march through the childhoods of both Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. Let's march right on up until their last days. It's just like an early 20th century game of dueling banjos. We'll do a little dueling Time Suck timeline. And then I think it'll be fun to bounce out. Reflect a little deeper on the duo and the times they lived in before we head on out of the episode. So let's get to it. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. March 24th, 1909. Clyde Chestnut Barrows, born just outside of Toledo, Texas, a little unincorporated community, 44 miles south of Dallas, with uh, two notable residents, according to the town's Wikipedia page Clyde Barrow and Jason Massey. Uh, a monster, born in 1973, who wrote about rape and murder fantasies in his diary growing up, worshipped Charles Manson, and was known to torture animals as a child. 
On July 26, 1993, uh, Jason murdered two teenagers, 14-year-old Brian King and Brian's 13-year-old stepsister, Christina Benjamin, in his hometown, and then was quickly connected to the crime by forensic evidence and arrested shortly after getting out of jail for animal cruelty. He was executed by lethal injection on April 3rd, 2001. Before his execution, he confessed to his crime uh, to the murdered teenager's family. His crime was documented on an episode of the TV series Forensic Files called Pure Evil. It was one of the few episodes of that show rated TV Mature. So, you know, high amount of bad seeds per capita coming out of old Toliko. Clyde was born to uh, Kumi Tabitha Barrow. Uh, I'm guessing Kumi. I couldn't find uh, any examples on YouTube of anybody saying this kind of name. It's, it's spelled Kumi. C-U-M-M-I-E. Old Cummy. Old Cummy Tabitha. Uh, maybe cum wasn't a uh, <laughs> common common word uh, for male semen back then. Or, or maybe it was. And that's, uh, that's how little her parents thought of, thought of her. What are we going to name the baby? Fuck, cum. I don't care. Just call her cum. It's, it's a girl. Well, call her cummy then. She's cummy. Call her cummy face. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So cummy, cummy Tabitha Barrow homemaker and henry barrow poor farmer he was the fifth of seven children you know what because when you're a poor farmer you don't pay for help around the farm you make help around the farm well on october 1st 1910 bonnie elizabeth parker was born in rowena texas a little town of a few hundred people in the center of the state 65 miles south of abilene and 27 miles northwest of san angelo so basically she'd be born in the sticks her father, Charles Parker, was a bricklayer, and her mother, Emma Parker, was the first woman to work on the International Space Station. Get the fuck out of here. That never happened. Uh, her mom stayed at home, took care of the kids. Uh, Bonnie had a roof over her head in Rowena, but not much else. Times were tough in much of Texas in the 30s, uh, when much of the country was reeling from the stock market crash in 1929. Well, in 1914, uh, Charles Parker, Bonnie's father, uh, dies at age 30 when his neck was broken in a fall off of a scaffold. His death was the inspiration for the now commonly uh, quoted saying, always check your shoes before you scaffold unless you want to slip and think you've caught your balance, but then you slip again and you fall off, but then you catch yourself, uh, but then you lose your grip and, and then you fall and you break your neck. Um, I, I'm sure you guys have heard that one. Uh, Emma Parker uh, then moved with her three kids from Rowena, Texas to her parents' home near West Dallas. Uh, she never remarries. Emma begins uh, working for the Overall Manufacturing Company as a seamstress, raises her kids in a town near West Dallas known as Cement City, which sounds like a fucking terrible place to grow up in the days before uh, Wi-Fi and Netflix. Atlas Obscurus describes the Cement City of the early 20th century as a small industrial town three miles west of Dallas. Sounds so much fun. So much fun to grow up in Cement City. Uh, so Bonnie never has a father figure in her life, starting at the age of four. Uh, her choice to hook up with not one but two career criminals uh, makes a little more sense when, con when you consider this possible uh, daddy issue angle. Uh, Bonnie would grow up in Cement City and go to Cement City High School, where she won numerous awards for poems, drama, and spelling, which she always enjoyed uh, when she was little. She hoped to become an entertainer. And I'll read one of her poems later, and i got to say, uh, talented, very talented. 1922, Clyde and his family move to Dallas. After they lose the farm in a bad drought, his dad runs a gas station, and the family lives in the back of it. That's right. Clyde grew up in a gas station. I don't feel like many people can say that. At least not many people can say it and have it actually be true, right? It's so weird. Where's, where's your room, Clyde? Oh, it's right, right between uh, pump number three and the, uh, the donut stand. Clyde attends school, studying in the back of that gas station until the age of 16, uh, where he and, and he, it's where he also learned how to play uh, both guitar and saxophone. He had dreams of becoming a musician, which I'm sure made his poor, uh, struggling father uh, just ecstatic. We lost the farm, and now you're focusing on the guitar, and, and even worse, the saxophone. Are you out of your goddamn mind? Why can't you study accounting like someone with some goddamn sense? We, we live in a gas station, Clyde. Please get a real job. The stock market's about to crash for fuck's sake. That's right, Henry Barrow, both cursed and predicted the future. Uncommon for a poor farmer in those days. Uh, 1925, young Bonnie Parker meets Roy Thornton. Bonnie met Roy Thornton late 1925 in Dallas. He's working as a waitress. Uh, Bonnie was 15, and 18-year-old Roy was already a petty thief whose actual job title uh, was welder. Uh, Bonnie was so crazy about Roy that she even had Bonnie and Roy tattooed in hearts on her inner thigh. Scandalous. Tattoos were around for sure uh, back in the 20s, but not super popular. Uh, Bonnie definitely had some bad girl hair. September 25th, 1926, the pair marries almost right away, and uh, they dive into a tumultuous relationship. Here's a, an excerpt from her diary. What, what would I do with these old time sucks if these fucking assholes didn't keep diaries? What a, what a lost art. Now all people have shitty Facebook posts. She says, Dear Diary, 
Before opening this year's diary, I don't know why she, I made a British. That's uh, well, Let's just run with it. Before opening this year's diary, I wish to tell you that I have a roaming husband with a roaming mind. We are separated again for the third and last time. The first time, August 9th through 19th, 1927. The second time, August 1st through 19th, 1927. And the third time, December 5th, 1927. I love him very much and miss him terribly, but I intend on doing my duty. I am not going to take him back. Let all men go to hell. But we are not going to sit back and let the world sweep us by. All right, very dramatic. I like it. But, you know, le legit drama. You get this kind of dude in your life. Uh, when Roy uh, returned in early 1929 after being gone for nearly a year, uh, Bonnie does finally kick him to the curb. Uh, and then Roy wound up in prison again for robbery. And even though Bonnie washed her hands of him, she felt it would just kind of look dirty, like sort of dirty to file divorce papers while he was locked up. So she never did. Uh, she was still married to him when she would die later. Uh, still had her wedding ring on from that first marriage when she when she passed away. Who knows if she made a, a separate deal with Clyde? Who knows? Uh, no one knows on that. But then side note on Roy, just like her next man, Clyde, old Roy uh, would end up getting shot to death. Locked up, uh, Roy met fellow inmate Charles Frazier, and the two concocted a plan for escape that would unfortunately end very badly for Roy. They attempted to escape twice, the first time on March 7th, 1937, with three other convicts. All five were caught when three were wounded and put back in their cells. But then they soon after tried to uh, escape again just a few days later. And this time, the pair led 27 other inmates in an escape that would not be successful again. Of the 27 inmates, Roy was the uh, one of two who met his uh, end as he was shot dead by the prison guards. Okay, well, 1926, uh, around this time, old Clyde, he was turned into a life of crime. Shortly after leaving uh, high school, he uh, was arrested for the first time on a charge of auto theft in 1926. His dad was probably happy that at least he just wasn't sitting around playing the saxophone. Uh, I don't know if that sentiment's true, but he was arrested. Clyde allegedly uh, initially arrested for automobile theft as a result of neglecting to return a rental car. Uh, I didn't even know they had rental cars back then. While these charges were dropped, Clyde was arrested again only three weeks later with his brother Buck, who would later initially refuse to join the Barrow Gang during the height of its notoriety. Uh, and then uh, Buck, I mean, uh, Clyde was arrested for a possession of uh, a truck full of stolen turkeys. And then Bonnie, uh, uh, in night, January 1930, Bonnie uh, meets Clyde Barrow, a friend who witnessed the uh, courting remarked, I could tell in Bonnie's eyes and her voice and the way she kept touching Clyde's sleeve as he talked, I, I knew that it was different from the young girl love she'd given to Roy. Even locked up, Roy heard about Bonnie running around with Clyde, and according to friends, he wanted to kill Clyde. I'm sure he did. When Bonnie took Clyde home to meet her mom, uh, he didn't exactly make a good impression. Police showed up and arrested him at her mom's house for a robbery he committed in Waco in various counts of auto theft. Man, I'm sure Emma Parker was just overjoyed. Her daughter's husband is in jail already. Now she brings home a new guy who gets arrested in her house. She, she probably probably poured herself a stiff drink in the uh, old Mother of the Year mug. Well, on March 11th, 1930, uh, even though the two had only dated a few weeks, they were already madly in love, and Bonnie smuggled a 32 Colt to Clyde in Waco County Jail. Uh, Clyde escaped, but he was uh, captured in Middleton, Ohio, on March 18, 1930, sentenced to 14 years hard labor back in Texas. Man, how, how different were prisons back in 1930? She smuggled in a, a gun, and, and he used it to escape. Life before metal detectors and mandatory pat-downs was just so much better for criminals, wasn't it? I just, uh, I couldn't figure out how she smuggled the gun in, never said anywhere. I'm not sure that, that was ever revealed. I'm going to go within her panties, because that seems the least likely place to get checked, and it's kind of sexy to me. Or maybe she was super hardcore, and she shoved that entire pistol up her ass. Maybe, we don't know. That is less sexy, but somehow more impressive. And then maybe Clyde then took it from her and then hit it up his, his own ass. Maybe that's what they bonded over. Ass play. I don't know. All right? When you Google, did Bonnie and Clyde enjoy ass play? Uh, nothing comes up that's relative to this narrative. Uh, by 1930, Clyde was incarcerated in the uh, Eastham Prison Farm on, on a 14-year term for automobile theft, robbery, and, of course, for his jailbreak. Uh, known as the Murder House or the Bloody Ham, uh, Eastham uh, was notorious for its tough working and living conditions. And uh, as well as guards who would beat inmates with trace chains and perform random spot killings, all of which substantiated by the were substantiated by the Texas State Legislature, Legislature, and the Osborne Association on U.S. Prisons, which ranks the Texas prison system as the worst in the nation in 1935. Damn. In 1972, prisoners at Eastham filed a class action lawsuit against the Texas Department of Corrections and won. In 1979, the court found conditions of imprisonment uh, within this uh, prison system uh, cr uh, constituted cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, if cruel and unusual punishment was going on in this place in the early 70s, one can only imagine how horrific it was back in the early 30s. Uh, well, during his time at Eastham, Clyde transformed from petty criminal to emotionless killer when he murdered Ed Crowder, 
a man who had been sexually assaulting him since he entered the prison. Ed was a vicious man known as Big Ed, six feet tall, 200 pounds. Clyde was only about 5'7", buck 30. He didn't have much of a chance to fight off Ed initially, but then Clyde decided he'd had enough of getting raped in prison. Uh, he, you know, he stabbed Ed, and he, he got a, in an altercation with Ed in the, in the prison, and uh, and stabbed him 15 times with a shank around midnight on October 29th in their cell. After that, uh, Clyde was done taking anyone's shit. While in Eastham, Clyde also witnessed uh, other murders. He, uh, he once out, uh, watched a young inmate being murdered by an older convict. Uh, and all of this left Clyde feeling just kind of hopelessly despondent. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to him, is uh, his mom is getting close to getting him paroled. She's fighting for that, and then unaware that her uh, attempts actually uh, become successful, he has a fellow convict chop off two of his toes with an axe. He did this uh, so he could get a break from his uh, prison work duties on the farm while recovering and just uh, in the prison infirmary. Man, how bad is that? How bad are the working conditions where you're like, you know what, I would rather chop off my own fucking toes than go out there and work on that chain gang for one more day. My God. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, six days after cutting off his toes, uh, he gets paroled. He gets that, uh, he gets that little pardon. So, uh, well, not a pardon. He gets, I'm sorry, early parole. Man, what a bitch that must've been. What, what, what mixed emotions you must have when you've, you're like, oh yeah, I'm out. Ah, ah, ah cut off my ah, fucking toes. God damn it. Well, Clyde uh, never fully recovered uh, physically or mentally from his stay in Eastham. He'd walk with a limp for the rest of his short life and his criminal career goal, uh, became not to get rich off of robberies, but to uh, enact revenge on Easton. Before getting out, he enlisted future gang member Ralph Foltz in a, in a plan to raise enough money and ammunition to raid the prison farm and kill all of the guards after his release. Ugh. Well, February, March 1932, immediately after being released from prison, the Barrow Gang uh, forms to include core members Clyde, Bonnie, Raymond Hamilton, W.D. Jones, Henry Methvin, uh, Clyde's brother, Buck Barrow, and Buck's wife, Blanche Barrow. And uh, they didn't form with all these members initially, but those would be the core members over the uh, the brief few years uh, that the gang would be around. And let's talk about these members really quick, get a feel for who these people are. We'll start with Raymond Hamilton. Uh, Clyde and Raymond had grown up together outside of Dallas. Raymond would go on to commit numerous robberies, even a murder or two with the gang. Uh, and they would also uh, later break him out of prison. When Hamilton uh, 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 got taken back into prison, he was executed on May 10th, 1935 at the Texas State Penitentiary, Huntsville, Texas, by electric chair. And uh, according to witnesses, Hamilton walked calmly and firmly to the chairs and seated himself with the words, well, goodbye, all. <laughs> all right. Uh, William Deacon, W.D. Jones. W.D. Jones. Uh, W.D. Jones is who uh, uh, created W.D. 40. Uh, he was robbing, robbing cars and things, and he d uh, developed a grease uh, to help things squeak less to alert the police to less uh, of the squeaks. Of course, uh, I, just, I just made that up poorly. Uh, no, W.D. Jones, uh, just a dude uh, who was 16 when he joined the gang in 1932. Uh, he came from a family that was dirt poor. Uh, he, too, had grown up with Clyde, first meeting him when he was just five years old. Uh, when he was six, his dad, older brother, and sister all died of Spanish flu within a couple days of each other. So like Bonnie, you know, like Clyde, you know, he, or uh, like Bonnie, excuse me, he grew up without a father. And maybe he saw a strange type of kind of father figure in Clyde. Uh, W.D. has been portrayed in media depictions of the gang as a dumb kid who uh, would run errands and just kind of did what Clyde told him. And then later, in an interview with the November 1968 edition of Playboy, uh, W.D. would agree with that depiction. He would say that was accurate. Uh, the num November 1968 Playboy uh, uh, Playmate of the Month, by the way, was Paige Young, uh, a young woman with a dark connection to Bill Cosby. Paige Young would kill herself with a single pistol gunshot to the head in 1974 writing in her suicide note that she was sick of being used and tossed aside by men. One of these men may have been Bill Cosby, who was rumored to have obsessed with Young during the height of her fame in the late 60s, and the two supposedly dated behind his wife's back for months. Bill Cosby, uh, gonna have to do a time suck on that motherfucker when all the smoke clears and we know exactly what all the real stories are. Well, uh, W.D. would end up getting arrested in Houston on November 16th, 1933. He was convicted of murder without malice and sentenced to 15 years for a crime uh, he had committed with the Barrow Gang. Interesting crime designation, murder without malice. Yeah, yeah, sure, I, I killed the fella, but I won't, I won't ain't no mad at him. Uh, all in all, uh, he reconciled himself to me as a real genial fellow. Uh, he just happened to be a standing where I needed to be a, a man not a standing to be, and, and that's how he got himself shot all up to hell. W weren't no malice in it anyway, no how. Well, February 1935, W.D. would also receive the maximum sentence for harboring in Alabama. Two years applied to run concurrently with his murder sentence. After six years in the Huntsville Penitentiary, uh, he would then get paroled. 
Jones would get out of prison in 1941 and live for many years next uh, door to his mom in Houston. He'd marry for a time, live a fairly quiet life, and then just like Bonnie and Clyde, he too would die by the bullet. Uh, in the early morning hours of August 20, 1974, Jones, accompanied by an acquaintance to a friend's home where she thought she would be given a place to sleep, uh, he goes along there, and then the friend does not allow, allow her in. An altercation ensues, and at 3.55 a.m., this friend shot Jones three times with a 12-gauge shotgun. Three times. All right. Uh, the man told police that Jones was a nice person when sober, but that he knew of Jones' reputation and was afraid of him. Goddamn. Uh, Jones was buried on August 22 at Brookside Memorial Park in Houston. Now we got Buck and Blanche Barrow. There was Marvin. Uh, Marvin Ivan Buck Barrow, and his people loved throwing names around, uh, Clyde's older brother, six years his senior. Uh, Buck was Clyde's early criminal mentor. He was making ends meet as a teenager in Dallas by stealing automobiles in cities all over Texas and selling them for a comfortable hundred bucks or so, uh, uh fenced them out of the state. He, he, he was once arrested just before Christmas, 1926, after getting caught with a, a truck full of stolen turkeys he'd intended to sell. Remember I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about Clyde. A uh, truck full of stolen turkeys he intended to sell for the holidays. Man, what a, what a crime to get caught for. These stolen fucking turkeys. Hey there, young fella. Uh, where'd you find those 30 turkeys you crammed into the back of your truck? Oh, oh, those officers, those are, those are just wild turkeys. Uh, I just found them, uh, I found them uh, uh, down, down along Turkey Creek. There ain't no Turkey Creek around these parts, boy. Oh, sure, sure there is. Sure there is, sir. Uh, uh, wh- where else would all the turkeys live? You know Maynard Johnson runs a turkey farm about 10 miles from here, don't you? And just this morning, someone in the truck, a truck looking just like this one, uh, done, done stole himself about 30 turkeys from uh, old Maynard's turkey farm. You don't say. Well that, well, that is a heck of a coincidence. You reckon he collects his turkeys uh, from Turkey Creek, same as me? Boy, you get your ass out of this truck, Turkey Creek. I don't plumb head enough of your turkey jibber-jabber. Well, on November 11, 1929, Barrow meets uh, Blanche Caldwell. Another future member of the Barrow Gang in an unincorporated part of Dallas County called West Dallas. They fall in love almost immediately. On November 29th, 1929, several days after meeting Blanche, uh, Marvin Barrow was shot and captured following a burglary burglary in Denton, Texas. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to four years in the Texas state prison system. But his loving was so good, Blanche waited. On March 8th, 1930, uh, 1930 uh, he just escapes from the Ferguson prison farm near Midway, Texas uh, by walking out of the prison stealing a a guard's car, and then driving to his parents' place in West Dallas where Blanche was living. Man, uh, Blanche already living at his parents' place. God, fucking relationships happened quick back then. Uh, No no messing around. And my God, the amount of people uh, who get shot in this uh, time suck is staggering. And and again, uh, what a great time to go uh, into prison in, in the sense that people seem to break out of prison all the fucking time back in the 20s and 30s. Clearly, they were still working out their security measures if dudes are literally just walking out the door. Somebody had to have gotten their ass reamed at least that day. Just how in God's name do the inmates keep getting out of this prison? Well, warden, uh, the good news is they ain't sneaking uh, through the fence. Uh, we don't check the whole fence and, and there ain't no holes in the fence no more. Well, what's the bad news? Well, warden, uh, the bad news is the lock on the front door don't work. <laughs> yeah. uh, and also, uh, I'm on, I'm going to need a new car cuz cuz Buck Buck Barrel done done drove it off when I was when I was taking my lunch. What kind of imbecile leaves their keys in their car when it's parked in front of a prison? Uh, well, uh, well, well warden, uh, the, the kind that uh, do believes that the front door is locked, uh, I reckon, uh, yeah, warden. <clears throat> well, on July uh, 3rd, 1931, uh, Blanche and Marvin are married in Oklahoma. Blanche is not interested in pursuing a criminal career, so she says. But then she and the other members of the Barrow family uh, convinced, uh, well, I guess at this time she's not. Because she and the other members uh, of the Barrow family convinced Buck to turn himself into the Texas prison authorities and complete his sentence so he doesn't have to live on the lam. Well, two days after Christmas, 1931, his mom and his wife drive him to the gates of Huntsville Penitentiary, uh, where he told surprise prison officials that he had escaped almost two years before and he needed to resume his sentence, and they just welcomed him in. (laughs) That is fucking hilarious to me. Uh, I don't think you, I don't think that would work that way now. I don't think they'd be like, yeah, 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 don't even worry about it. Uh, we still have your old, uh, locker in by yourself. Why do, why do I think that prisoners have lockers all of a sudden like it, there is the fucking gym? <laughs> we still, we still have, we still have your old cell. Just, uh, go on in there. You, you remember, uh, uh, Squinty? You remember your old prison roommate Squinty? Squinty Jones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, bottom bunk, still yours. Fuck no, you'd get like, uh, it's so much more added to your sentence. But I guess back then they were just like, people were escaping from prisons so often if they, if you came back in and they just didn't have to chase you down, they was like, yeah, no, that's great. Fine, fine. Come back, come on back. So uh, before he served two years of his six-year sentence remaining, uh, he was abruptly pardoned. 
uh, part of uh, uh, Texas Governor Ma Ferguson's plan to decrease prison crowning, and uh, partly due to the lobbying efforts of his wife and mom. Well, prison didn't seem to reform Buck. Uh, I don't even know why he went back, because uh, shortly after his release on March 22nd, 1933, uh, in the company of Blanche, he joins his younger brother Clyde's and uh, gang uh, in Joplin, Missouri, where he went on to participate in several armed robberies, the killing of several police officers, and then on July 19th, 1933, get himself shot in the head. Oh, these guys. These guys. Um, they just couldn't, they couldn't stay, out, stay away from crime. He was mortally wounded uh, after getting shot in the head and shoot out at the Red Crown Tourist Court at Platte City, Missouri. The bullet opened a large hole in his forehead, exposed his brain, and ca- caused severe loss of blood. Uh, Blanche was also wounded in the same gunfight. Uh, she'd lose sight in one eye. Uh, but despite his horrible head wound, he was still fully conscious, talked and ate. And then incredibly, old Bucky head wound got into another gunfight. July 24th, Buck near death was wounded in the back during yet another shootout. This time near an abandoned amusement park between, uh, between Redfield and Dexter, Iowa. Bonnie, Clyde, W.D. Jones, all wounded in the same gunfight. They escaped. Uh, but Marvin, old Buck and Blanche, uh, they were captured. Blanche would, uh, again, lose sight in her eye uh, from a shotgun blast. And ended up serving 10 years in prison, uh, despite, or getting sentenced 10 years in prison, uh, despite numerous other gunshot wounds, including the initial wound that put off an odor that was almost unbearable to be near. That's right. His head wound uh, is reeking. Uh, Buck still holds on to life in the hospital for five days. He's able to say goodbye to his mom, say goodbye to some siblings, have some meals, speak to investigators several times, spoke to his doctors. Uh, he, was, he was chatting with one doctor who then asked him, uh, where are you wanted by the law? And he uh, still uh, still has his uh, mental faculties before he dies. He says, wherever I've been. Oh, classic Buck. That's vintage Buck right there. That's just Buck being Buck. And finally, we have uh, uh, Henry Methvin. Henry was the final member to join the Barrel Gang. He just happened to be the right place at the right time when the gang broke out Raymond uh, Hamilton out of prison in January 6, 1934. And in the confusion, uh, Methvin and three other inmates took the opportunity to escape with Hamilton. Though Hamilton initially uh, ordered them all to go back, Clyde welcomed the convicts and ordered, uh, offered to let them join the gang. The three other men chose to take their chances alone, but Methvin accepted Clyde's offer to stay. And then he remained with Bonnie and Clyde until a few days before their deaths. When on May 19, 1934, uh, he, uh, Methvin was sent into a diner to get sandwiches for the rest of the gang in Dallas. And then while he was at the counter, a police car passed by, uh, gave him a suspicious glance, and Clyde drove off, just leaving him there. So that's the gang. That is the gang, the Barrow Gang. Now let's uh, let's see what the gang got into over the next few years. But first, let's check in with today's sponsor. Uh, this Bonnie and Clyde Time Suck is brought to you by Dollar Shave Club. Just because you're not willing uh, to abandon your day job and live a life of bank robberies, screeching tire getaways, and police shootouts, doesn't mean you still can't have some fun by making the smarter choice and switching over to the Dollar Shave Club. I switched, and I love it. I love the executive razor, manly, weighty handle, six st- stainless steel blades per cartridge. And you get four cartridges sent to your home every month, and you get a tube of Dr. Carver shave butter. Love the shave butter. Feels so good on my face. Sometimes I rub it on my face when I first get into the shower, and then I just leave it on for a few minutes before I shave. Just let it soothe me. And if you're thinking, but Dan, you have a full beard. What are you shaving on your face? Well, I'm shaving the top of my cheekbones, nosy Nelly. You have no idea how much hair I have on my face. If I didn't shave, uh, I'd have hair going just kind of straight to my eyeballs, and my neck hair would just go down and connect with my chest. It's like I'm a quarter Sasquatch. But you know what? Dollar Shave Club doesn't care how much Sasquatch you've got in you. All right? It shaves any and all hair with no razor irritation and no ingrown hairs, not with Dr. Carver Shave Butter. So get a great shave at a great price, conveniently delivered right to your door. Don't go to the store. Don't spend a fortune on gimmicky shaving tech you don't need. Give Dollar Shave Club a try. For a limited time, time suckers get their first month of the executive razor with a tube of their Dr. Carver Shave Butter for five bucks with free shipping. After that, razors are just a few bucks a month. That's a $15 value for only $5. In your first month's box, you get an awesome way to handle a full cassette of four cartridges and a tube of their shave butter. After your first month, replacement cartridges ship automatically at the regular price. No hidden fees, no commitments. Cancel anytime you like. And you can only get this offer exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash time suck. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash time suck. All right. March 22, 1932. Bonnie is arrested. Uh, on one of Clyde's first robberies after he's released, Bonnie goes with him. Their plan is uh, uh, for the Barrel Gang was to rob a hardware store. Uh, although she stayed in the car during the robbery, uh, Bonnie was caught put in the Kaufman, Texas jail, and then she was later released for a lack of evidence, because as you're going to find throughout this episode, uh, the police in the early 30s were terrible. Uh, March 1932, 
uh, first bank robbery for the gang. Around the same time as the hardware store, the gang robbed the first bank, hitting the first national bank in Lawrence, Kansas at 746 Massachusetts Street. The bank building is now a fancy restaurant named Teller's, complete with the original walk-in vault that serves as the entrance to the restaurant's bathroom if you want to go there for a, a meal or snack and enjoy the ambiance of where Bonnie and Clyde caused mayhem. Well, I guess more just Clyde on this one. The gang rents a room at the Eldridge Hotel across from the bank. The bank's visible from the hotel. It's a bustling bank. Maybe too busy for these bank robbing newbies, but they keep watching. Right? The next morning, they see the bank president walking down Massachusetts Street. He's alone. He unlocks the front doors about 10 minutes before any other blank bank employees arrive. They remember that. They study that. The morning after that, Barrow and Ralph Foltz, an occasional associate of the uh, Barrow gang, he, they meet the president at the front door. Barrow shows him a sawed-off shotgun. Uh, two bank employees then walk up the sidewalk towards them. Damn it, they were hoping he was alone, but oh well. Fultz meets the other two, and the trio are then quickly escorted into the bank. Into the vault they go, and out comes a bag of coin and currency. Hamilton is in the tin can with the motor running. There's no stopping until East St. Louis. And the cash is counted, and it's $33,000. That's the equivalent of about half a million in today's terms. A lot of money. However, uh, that would be like their, like their biggest haul. Most of the gang's criminal endeavors wouldn't be nearly so lucrative. Not at all. Uh, yeah, they, sh- they probably should have stopped there, really, in hindsight. But, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't start robbing a couple places and then just quit. That's not how it seems to work. Uh, March 25th, uh, 1932, Clyde and Ray Hamilton robbed Sims Oil Company in Dallas, Texas for 300 bucks. Not exactly 33000 but I guess it's better than making the average hourly wage of a factory job back then, which was 45 cents an hour. Uh, April 27, 1932, Clyde robs and kills grocer and jeweler John Butcher in Hillsboro, Texas. Now, Clyde had worked at, a, at an auto top company with the youth who had an elderly relative by the name of John Butcher, uh, who ran a combination filling station and pawn shop in Hillsboro. Clyde had been there several times before with the youth from the auto company and remembered seeing a safe in the rear of Mr. Butcher's establishment. Uh, Clyde, Raymond Hamilton, and the young tough by the name of uh, Frank Claus, who roll with the gang, you know, for a few weeks, uh, hitting up a few gas stations here and there, uh, they decide to rob the old man. Clyde remained outside in the car to avoid being recognized by Mr. Boucher, uh, who had known Clyde to be a visitor in the past. It was shortly before midnight when Ray and Frank awakened Mr. Boucher and his wife from their sleep uh, to come down. I think I said Butcher before. Not that you're like, uh, isn't it Boucher? It is. Uh, they wakened uh, uh, Mr. Boucher and his wife from their sleep to come down and open the shop to sell them some guitar strings. Yeah, that sounds legit. <laughs> and I guess he buys it, according to this story. I mean, I shouldn't be laughing because he's about to die. But uh, what? What? Who the fuck was like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, don't even worry about it. Let me get up. Let me get my slippers on and go downstairs and open my store uh, at, at midnight and and just get you uh, some guitar strings that you apparently just have to have right this second. Uh, after a com- He did complain about how late it was. Uh, he does go downstairs and lets, lets the guys into his shop. Uh, after receiving the 25-cent guitar strings, uh, they handed Mr. Boucher a $10 bill, which required him to open the safe in order to make change. As Mr. Boucher uh, didn't have his eyeglasses with him, he calls to his wife. She comes down to help, turns the combination, opens the safe, and then a nervous Raymond Hamilton points his gun at the elderly shopkeeper, demands his contents. In a moment of panic, the gun accidentally goes off. The bullet strikes Mr. Boucher in the heart, kills him instantly, right in front of his wife. Damn it. Two bins uh, run from the store have taken about 40 bucks and some jewelry. Shot an old man. He woke up in the middle of the night. Ah, uh, right in front of his wife. Takes a little romance out of the story of their gang. You know, accident or not, what a completely unnecessary tragedy. Old guy who did nothing to them. Right from the get-go, uh, the dead bodies of innocent people would be part of the gang's crime spree. On July 31st, 1932, uh, Clyde and Ray Hamilton robbed the uh, Newhoff Packing Company in West Dallas, uh, Texas, for 1100 escaped to Oklahoma. Um, on their way there, they drop off Bonnie in Dallas to stay with some family for a little bit. And then in Atoka, Oklahoma, they shoot and kill Sheriff Maxwell and Deputy Moore in a crime unrelated to robbery. Uh, sometime after 10 p.m. on the evening of Saturday, August 5th, 1932, Gene Moore and Sheriff Charlie Maxwell drove the eight miles from Atoka to Stringtown, apparently to investigate a disturbing the peace complaint. Sheriff Maxwell may have called on Moore and, and not another available deputy to accompany him to Stringtown because he wanted to ride in Moore's new Chevrolet. Uh, since the source of the noise, you know, so this is like a, a laid back call. Since the source of the noise was a country and western dance, both lawmen felt sure that some of the dancers would be violating some local, state, and federal prohibitions against consuming alcohol, and they arrived just before 11 p.m. According to witness Duke Ellis, Barrow and Hamilton had been dancing and drinking, uh, but he says, I did not see either of them get out of line. Uh, and then they go to their car, and then Sheriff Maxwell and Gene Moore drive up, and the lawmen spotted some men apparently drinking in a nearby car. 
and Maxwell goes to investigate. According to Maxwell's other deputy, Sheriff Oscar Folsom, uh, who was not present, the two lawmen had in their custody a woman who had escaped from prison in McAllister uh, earlier and Moore stayed with her in his car. Evidently confirming the men's suspicious behavior, Sheriff Maxwell walked over to the car, tells the men that they consider themselves under arrest, not suspecting trouble, he did not have his gun drawn, and then pistol shots ring out. Uh, Maxwell was hit several times, did not fall until, until he had taken seven bullets, Moore leaps from his car, ducks behind a Model T for cover, draws his gun, raises up to see that the assailants uh, are there, and immediately was dropped by a single bullet from a 30 caliber Stevens automatic rifle. As Barrow and Hamilton made their getaway, they continued to fire shots back at the fleeing crowd. When help reaches the fallen lawmen, they found Moore dead, but Maxwell still alive. Uh, reportedly close to death, he was taken to McAllister Hospital, where following surgery, he recovered, though he was crippled for life, according to the newspapers. Yeah, I bet. He was shot seven fucking times. Uh, the more I learn about this gang, the more I understand why Bonnie and Clyde were shot to pieces when they were finally caught. They didn't hesitate uh, to shoot anyone else uh, when it benefited them. Or at least their gang. All right? She clearly wasn't there, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, so why should they be treated any differently? The manner of their death seems kind of fitting, actually. And, and if you're wondering why they kept bouncing around between so many different states, it's because back then state cops couldn't pursue you across state lines, not legally. Uh, not all states had passed a form of the Uniform Act of Fresh Pursuit in the early uh, 1930s, allowing state police to cross state lines when pursuing a person or person suspected of committing a felony. So, you like, you know, you could rob a bank in Kansas City, Missouri, for example, and if you could avoid getting caught until you made it to Kansas City, Kansas, you could get away with it. Unless you caught the attention of the feds who could track you anywhere. Well, Clyde and the gang knew all these state laws very well, and that's why after uh, almost all their crimes, they would bounce as fast as they could to the next state. August 6, 1932, Bonnie rejoins Clyde near Grand Prairie, Texas, and on August 13, 1932, Bonnie and Clyde took Sheriff Joe Johns of Carlsbad, New Mexico hostage. He found it suspicious that a bunch of young adults would roll into town in a brand new Ford, he ran the plate number and found out it was stolen, uh, follows them to where they were staying with some relatives, questioned them, uh, and to arrest them. Bonnie answers the door uh, when he knocks. He asks her uh, who the car belonged to. Bonnie coyly tells him that it belongs to a couple of boys staying there and that they uh, were getting dressed and that she would go uh, get them for him. Well, while waiting for them to come out, he decides to go over to the car and investigate further. Clyde arms himself with a shotgun. He's watching this now. He found in the house, and he and Raymond ran around the side of the house and overtake the surprised lawman and relieve him of his service revolver. Whether intentionally or by accident, the shotgun discharged, just missing the officer's head and blowing away his hat. So they almost killed another police officer. Well, Clyde calls to Bonnie to get in the car, and they all take off, taking the deputy sheriff with them. And then on August 14, 1932, they release Sheriff Johns in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I guess they didn't just, you know, kill everybody. And then they steal another car in Victoria, Texas and escape a police trap in Colo on the, at the Colorado River Bridge in Wharton, Texas. Man, just constantly fucking barreling down the road, going from one crime to the next. October 8, 1932, Clyde and Ray Hamilton rob a bank in Cedar Hill, Texas for $1,400. Three days later, commit another murder. On October 11, 1932, at approximately 6.25 p.m., Clyde Barrow and two accomplices entered Sherman, Texas, parked their car in Hazelwood Street, just north of Wells Street. The robbery target was the little grocery store at the northwest corner of Wells and Vaden Streets around 6.30 p.m. Clyde Barrow walked to the front entrance of the Vaden Streets, uh, store on Vaden Street. Mr. Glaze was the clerk on duty, and Mr. Hall was at the rear of the building in the meat market area. Both men were preparing to close the store. Just minutes prior, Mr. Little had moved most of the proceeds from the day to his home, just north of the grocery store. He had left approximately 60 bucks in the register to allow for last-minute customer purchases at the end of the workday. At this same moment... Uh, Mrs. Lester C. Uh, Butler pulls up to the Well Street side entrance to make a last-minute purchase before going home. According to Mr. Glaze, Clyde Barrow looked nervous as he entered the store from Vaden Street about 6.30 p.m. He did not recognize Clyde as a previous customer and attributed his nervousness to a new customer being in an unfamiliar store. Clyde picked up a loaf of bread, walked to the cash register at the northwest part of the building. Mr. Glaze asked him if he needed anything else, and he said... Yes, a half dozen eggs and some lunch meat. After collecting these items, he handed Mr. Glaze a dollar for the purchase. Mr. Glaze looked down, opened the register to make change. When he looked up, Clyde flashed a gun, moved him out of the way, began to rifle through the till. Mr. Hall, as he looked up and realized what was happening, walked between the south end of the glass meat market counter and the south wall of the store and exclaimed, Young man, you can't do that. Kind of a weird weird thing to say. The guy's uh, holding a gun. As if the guy just didn't know how shit worked at stores. Young, young man, you can't do that. You can't point guns at people and just take money. That's not, that's not how it works, young man. You're, you're supposed to leave your gun in its holster and you, you, pay, you give us money for things. That's how commerce works. You give us money uh, for things because we have to pay for things. We have a small markup 
and then we sell you those things, and that's how this economy uh, keeps going. And then the young guy's gonna be like, oh, 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 shit, well, hold, hold on. So I don't, so wait a minute. So I pay you uh, a nominal amount uh, for these goods, uh, slightly higher than what you're able to pay. That way, you're able to provide for your family and then for providing a fair, uh, 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 you know, system of goods uh, for us to purchase here. And then I take that. And, and then I take my goods, and then so you get the small profit, I get an item that I need for sustenance, and then we all kind of just keep going along. Yes, yes, young man, that's exactly how it works. Oh, <laughs> I, feel, I feel foolish. I, I thought I took what I wanted from you and pulled a gun out and also took your money. No, young man, that's, that's not how it works at all. Well, <laughs> you guys got to have a sign. You got to put up a sign to let us know. Well, the bandit was instantly infuriated. Of course he was. Uh, he backs Mr. Glaze to the center of the store, orders Mr. Hall to the same area, uh, begins backing both men towards the side entrance at Well Street while kicking, hitting, and cursing at Mr. Hall. Uh, Mrs. Butler, another woman uh, who happens to uh, stumble into all this, she begins to walk into the store. She observes the crime in progress and seeks refuge at the southwest corner of the building. As the three men near the side door, Clyde hit Mr. Hall in the face so hard his glasses flew out the door and onto Well Street sidewalk. He begins to strike again. Mr. Hall reaches uh, for the striking arm. Clyde immediately opens fire, mortally wounding Mr. Hall with three bullets to the chest. Mr. Hall fell out of the side door. Clyde stepped over him, shot at him one more time as he lay on the sidewalk. God, man, really fucking pissed him off. And then turned his attention to Mr. Glaze, who stood in shock and horror uh, just outside the open door. Man, uh, Clyde aimed at Mr. Glaze, pulls the trigger, but the gun misfires. He then ran, uh, ran along uh, Well Street past Mrs. Butler and the two boys that were playing, or some two boys that were playing, and entered a large Buick sedan that was parked facing north on Hazelwood Street, just north of Well Street. Uh, Mr. Hall is carried off by ambulance attendants to the St. Vincent Sanitarium just across Well Street, and then medical personnel indicate uh, that he was uh, dead by 7.30 p.m. God, man, shit like that. Shit like that takes a little bit of the likability out of old Clyde. It's like, yeah, maybe that guy was uh, a little, little surly with you. For robbing him, you son of a bitch. Let him let him be annoyed. My God. But Bonnie still loved her, Clyde. She would still follow him to the ends of the earth. November 9, 1932, Bonnie and Clyde robbed uh, Aronigo Bank, Aronigo, Missouri, uh, for 200 bucks. I hope that's how you say it. Uh, turns out YouTube pronunciation videos don't give a fuck about Aronigo, Missouri. Uh, literally no one talks about it on YouTube. Uh, the next month, they're joined by W.D. Jones, Dallas, Texas, uh, in Dallas, Texas, who'd soon witness his first murder. Uh, December 25th, 1932, uh, the Barrow Gang uh, took on this new member. While in Temple, Texas, this uh, new member, an old friend of Clyde's, W.D. Jones, who we met earlier, spotted a brand new motor car, 606 South 13th Street, with the keys still in the ignition. Ha, ha, damn! He climbs inside the vehicle, attempts to start it, however, possibly because of the cold weather, he doesn't get it going. Clyde goes to assist Jones in trying to get the car started. And then Doyle Johnson, 27-year-old grocery clerk for the Strasburger store in Temple, uh, is taking a nap after just finishing a meal. He's awakened by the sound of his relatives screaming at somebody outside. And when he goes to, to the car, he grabs a hold of Clyde to prevent him from stealing it. And we know, uh, we know, you know earlier from the grocery store incident that Clyde does not like people trying to prevent him from stealing things. While holding on to uh, Barrow, Doyle Johnson yelled to his family to call the police. Barrow begins screaming at Mr. Johnson to get back or I'll kill you. Clyde's, again, not happy. Uh, when he continued to struggle with the young car thief, he gets shot in the neck, falls lifelessly to the ground. Bonnie collected Clyde and WD in the faster Ford V8, and together they made their getaway. Doyle Johnson died the next day. That's uh, what happened. I'm surprised he made it that long after getting shot in the neck. On December 26, 1932, leaving behind a young wife and infant son. Again, man, uh, Clyde, man, ruthless motherfucker. Uh, he did not hesitate to shoot people if they uh, tried to intervene in any way. January 6, 1933, uh, Clyde escapes ambush, kills two more investigators, Malcolm Davis and Fred Bradbury in Dallas, Texas, hold another officer hostage, policeman Thomas Purcell, uh, for a few days later, drop him off uh, six hours later after taking his gun on the way to their Joplin, Missouri hideout, the location of perhaps their most famous gunfight outside of the one that took their lives. March 22, 1933, Buck Barrow receives that pardon we mentioned earlier from Huntsville Penitentiary uh, is released. Um, yeah, I think I referred to it as a, a parole possibly earlier. Uh, you know what? They, they go to they go to in and out of jail so many goddamn times. It gets confusing. I guess it doesn't really matter. Paroled, fucking pardoned. <laughs> says here he got pardoned. He, he was released. And then he and his wife Blanche uh, head to Joplin to join his little brother's gang. 
uh, yeah, this this particular time suck, but it, it is so crazy. There was just like so many conflicting dates. I think I, I I don't know why. There's just so much information about Bonnie and Clyde out on the web, but like no two websites seem to agree. Uh, so one website will attribute one timeline to them, another one attributes another. So I kind of just you know had to like keep bouncing around through all these different articles and just kind of go with the ones that seemed uh, the most legit. Um, you know, so again, some of these things would say pardon, some of these things say parole. I think we're getting, I think we're getting the basic facts right about these motherfuckers and getting just kind of a general good idea of who they were. Um, people who just constantly were stealing and robbing and killing and in and out of jail. Um, so yeah, so he's released him and Blanche, Buck and Blanche. They go to Joplin to, uh, join his little brother's gang. Uh, man, a couple days out of the joint, uh, and they're right back at it. Uh, April 13th, 1933, uh, is when they reunite. And uh, it's Buck and Clyde and Bonnie and WD and, and Blanche, and they're all hanging out in a newly constructed apartment in Joplin, Missouri at 34th Street. Uh, it's still there, uh, and Oak Ridge Drive, two blocks off of a main street for 12 days. And then a patrol car uh, pulls up in front of the apartment's garage doors on April 13th. Uh, five lawmen tipped to the possibility that outlaws might be in the apartment approach the dwelling, and that would be a big mistake for them. Uh, without warning, the outlaws opened fire on the lawmen. Turns out this little apartment had tons of windows. Uh, they were always prepared to leave really quick. They always parked the car like they backed it into the garage so they could make a quick escape. Uh, Harry McGinnis, 53, a Joplin detective. John Wesley Harriman, 41, a Newton County constable, were shot. Harriman died instantly. McGinnis would die later. The other lawmen, Walter E. Grammer and George B. Kaler, both with the Missouri State Highway Patrol, and Thomas DeGraff, a Joplin detective, would survive the shootout. Uh, the gang emerged from the garage in Clyde Barrel's 1932 V8 Ford, but the patrol car was blocking the gang's exit. So one of them gets into the patrol car and tries to get it to roll down the hill in front of the apartment, but couldn't. Uh, so then they rammed the Ford into the patrol car to move it out of the way. After that, they fled south on Main Street and eventually escaped through Spring City. Man, and 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 again, I guess it just sucked to be the fucking police back then. I feel like these guys are just, you know, manhandling them. Every time Bonnie and Clyde and their very kind of small skeleton crew gang encounter any police officers, they just fucking destroy them. Uh, the shootout was front page news across the country, and what investigators found later in their, uh, you know, kind of hideout apartment is what immortalized the duo. Uh, the gang left behind most of their belongings in their quick getaway, including various guns, jewelry, and most importantly uh, for their kind of recognition, I guess, or, the, you know, becoming infamous, a camera with two rolls of undeveloped film. Uh, film has been shot by uh, Blanche Barrow, and when the pictures were developed, uh, you know, later all five gang members were pictured, and among the photos, you know, was a snapshot of Bonnie with a cigar that became quite famous, you know, cigar clenching her teeth, uh, holding the gun. It kind of became the identifying photo of Bonnie for the press. I guess what she hated, because she was just kind of doing it as a lark. She didn't actually smoke cigars. And uh, later she would send letters to several newspapers uh, just, you know, telling them to please tell people that she didn't smoke cigars. I love that she was just, you know, worried about that part of her image. Yeah, the, the, the being associated with the murderers and stuff, no, that's, that's, that's totally accurate. Yes, no, no, definitely part of the gang. Uh, definitely just, you know, don't care about all the fucking collateral damage we're causing. It's the cigar thing. Please be a little more careful on the cigar accuracy. I'm going to have a, a bunch of those photos that they found posted at timesuckpodcast.com in the episode description if you're curious. Um, after fleeing Joplin, uh, the gang gets right back to robbing, stealing cars and kidnapping. Uh, April 27th, 1933, Bonnie, Clyde, WD, Buck, Blanche, steal a car, uh, kidnap Undertaker, H.D. Darby, his fiance Sophie Stone, later releasing them unharmed in Ruston, Louisiana. Uh, May 8th, uh, Bonnie and Clyde and the Barrow Gang rob Lucerne State Bank, Indiana. Eh, 300 bucks. Not hitting those big payday, you know, anymore like the when they started. But again, some money. Uh, May 15th, they get 1500 bucks from a first state bank and, uh, in uh, Minnesota, and then the gang has another run-in with the law next month that would leave Bonnie permanently injured. Uh, permanently injured. Uh, June 10th, 1933, several members of the Sam Pritchard family were sitting on their porch when they heard a speeding car approaching. They watched as the Ford Coupe missed a detour and plummeted off a river embankment where a previous bridge was washed out. And, and again, I'll just stop right here in this kind of story. I, from what I kind of gathered from several articles, the way they try to describe this, it sounds like they were built. They had built like a new bridge. And they hadn't quite fully, uh, you know, rerouted the road in total to the new bridge. Like they built a new bridge, they had the detour, but then there was still the old road, which went to just no bridge where the, you know, the previous bridge was. And that one had been torn down. So basically what happened was that uh, Bonnie and Clyde in their car, they just, they fucking missed the detour as they're just zipping through the state and just drove right off into the open air and just crashed into the riverbank. 
Um, so men from the house, they rush out to the car, pull out the two occupants, uh, and douse the smoking car with river water. Uh, the rescuers pull out two men and a woman. You know, the woman later identified as Bonnie Parker from the car. And uh, the two men seized firearms from the wreckage. Alonzo Cartwright, Pritchard's son-in-law, drove into Wellington to get a doctor for Bonnie who suffered serious burns and was carried to the Pritchard house. Well, the Pritchards uh, had no idea uh, these people were outlaws wanted in a series of killings and bank robberies. Um, Sam Pritchard would later tell his wife, the Barrow brothers didn't mean anything to me. All I knew was that they were hurt and needed help, so we just naturally had to help them. Uh, Collinsworth County Sheriff George Corey and Police Chief Paul Hardy drove up to the Richard Pritch- or the Pritchard home uh, and found Bonnie Parker laying on a bed, apparently unconscious. Clyde Barrow and another gang member heard the two officers uh, come into the home. Parker emerged from the bedroom and took their guns. During the excitement, Gladys Cartwright, holding a baby in one arm, reached over to latch a door. Uh, one of the desperados, apparently concerned that the other officers might be nearby, fired his shotgun through a window, buckshot ripped through Mr. Cart- uh, Mrs. Cartwright's right hand. Uh, one of the men then shot out the tires on one of the uh, family cars. Before leaving, Clyde Barrow thumbed through a roll of bills, offered to pay for all the trouble we've been to you, but Sam Richard Pritchard replied, no, if a man can't help another man, things are in pretty bad shape, uh, according to the county's official history. Uh, the trio handcuffed the sheriff and the police chief and then sped off in the sheriff's car toward the Oklahoma uh, city or state line. Somewhere near uh, Sayre, western Oklahoma, the outlaws tied the officers to a cottonwood tree with barbed wire, and then sped off into history uh, after having another daring escape uh, from the law. Man, just constantly escaped from the law. Uh, June 19th, 1933, Clyde left Fort Smith, Arkansas to pick up Bonnie's sister, Billy Parker, uh, in Dallas, Texas, to take care of the injured Bonnie, and they were right back after their robin. Uh, at, at this point, they were they were too wanted to return to a straight job. You know, It was kind of just keep robbing until you get caught or killed or turn yourself in. And after Clyde's prison rape experience, uh, he's not turning himself in. June 23rd, 1933, uh, while returning from Fayetteville after robbing the R.L. Brown Grocery Market, Barrow and Jones uh, encountered Alma Marshal Henry D. Humphrey and Crawford County Deputy Sheriff Ansel Red Sawyers on Highway 71 north of Alma. In the ensuing exchange of gunfire, Humphrey was shot in the chest, dies three days later in a local hospital. The members of the Barrow gang and Parker's sister Billy narrowly escaped that night to Oklahoma and then to Kansas. A plaque on the grounds of the city complex building in Alma commemorates Humphrey's death. Just leaving more bodies in the wake. June 25th, 1933, Clyde and W.D. steal a new car in uh, Enid, Oklahoma, rob the National Guard Armory of automatic weapons and ammunition. Maybe. Uh, again, here's this problem with crime legends. The more dirty deeds they do, the more extra deeds get attributed to them. You need you read four books on Bonnie and Clyde, you get four different accounts of what fucking happened here and there. Uh, you know, maybe they rob an extra bank in one book. Maybe they hit an armory in another. Maybe they get caught up in an extra shootout. Maybe Clyde Barrow rips his face off to reveal that he was wearing a mask the whole time and is none other than Bojangles. That mangy one-eyed mutt was behind this whole crime spree. God damn it, Bojangles. Bad dog. Bad dog. But anyway, I like the armory story, so it's going to stay in this timeline. Uh, June 26, 1933, Bonnie Clyde, W.D., Buck, Blanche, return Billy uh, to, to Sherman, Texas, travel to Oklahoma, then to Great Bend, Kansas, and hold up three gas stations in July. Uh, July uh, 20th, uh, the gang gets into one hell of a firefight. Clyde chose the Red Crown Tavern as an ideal hideout. Its location between two intersecting highways provided an easy escape route if needed. They rented two single-story brick cabins. Between them were two wide garages, a convenient place to stash stolen car. Uh, the raid on the cabin started at 11 o'clock by local authorities. The officers ordered the group out. Blanche tells them to wait while they get dressed. Clyde responds by firing on them with his powerful Browning automatic rifle. Sheriff Coffee was hit in the neck, and the steel-jacketed bullet sliced through the armored police car. Uh, Buck ran outside and began spraying the area with bullets from his automatic rifle. Buck is then hit by Captain William Baxter in the head. Severely wounded, obviously, he's shot in the fucking head, but not dead. He's dragged into the back of a car. The police open fire on Barrow's getaway car, blinding Blanche with flying glass. She'd permanently lose sight in one eye. Again, these are things we touched on earlier. The gang made their getaway, but at a heavy cost to all. Bonnie and Clyde escaped the barrage of bullets. Uh, they leave Sheriff Holt Coffey, son Clarence, and a Jackson County Sheriff all wounded. In the next few days, uh, not so glorious for the gangsters. After the shootout at the Red Crown hideout, the Barrow Gang heads north and crosses the border into Iowa. Upon reaching the village of Dexter, they settle in the, uh, to a 20-acre wooded recreation area called Dexfield Park to lick their wounds. Exhaustion, panic, and painful moans fill the air that summer. Uh, summer day on July 20th, uh, Buck is delirious and in great pain. 
He suffered a vicious head wound. Uh, Blanche, you know, his face is, is facing blindness from the shards of glass that had showered down on her when the car's windows were shot out. The scabs from Bonnie's recently burnt legs have reopened, causing them to bleed. And they had to endure all this without uh, the aid of medication because they had left it back at the Red Crown hideout. Man, this is the, this is the not fun part at all of being a gangster on the run. Uh, after making rough beds on the ground for Buck and Bonnie, the lesser injured busied themselves in washing up at a nearby stream, applying makeshift bandages to Buck's head, and Bonnie's legs, that had to be great for Buck. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know we can see your brains. I, I Stop fucking crying about it. I know we can see your brains, but don't even worry about it. I know I'm not a doctor, but I do have a bandage that's been washed in a creek. And w- w- let, hear me out. Let's just wrap it on your brain and then just try not to think about it. Try not to think about it. That's the best we can do right now. I think you, you'll probably be okay. <laughs> that's fucking terrible. Uh, well, uh, Clyde's plans for returning his brother back home to his mother then become a priority. Uh, cause he does not expect him to survive these horrible injuries, which he does not. And I guess earlier they'd promised their mom that if either one of them were badly hurt or dying, they would bring, uh, they would come back home to her. What a fucking terrible position for a parent. Well, that's, that's the state of your kids. We're like, look, I know you're going to be fucking career criminals. I know you're going to rob and kill. Just, would you just do me this when you die, which will probably be soon. Try to get home to mama so I can say goodbye before my baby dies. Like, that's the position they put their mom in. Um, on the third day, uh, a third day of doing this, on July 23rd, <laughs> they've been uh, h- hiding, hiding out uh, in, in the woods here. Uh, the group goes to buy some medical supplies and food, leaves the campsite for a few hours, and then a local who's been taking a stroll through the park finds evidence suggesting that someone had burned some bloody bandages. He heard the radio reports telling of the possibility of wounded fugitives being in the area, calls town marshal John Love, who then con- contacts Sheriff C.A. Nee, Sheriff Nee, didn't take any chances, as he knew he would, who he'd be dealing with. Uh, he makes a call to his dentist friend, Herschel Keller, who's also a National Guardsman. I don't know why the article had to uh, refer to him first as dentist, and they form a posse. Uh, I feel like National Guardsman may be more important to Dennis. It's kind of, kind of weird when you first read across that. You're like, and so he did what he needed to do to catch these criminals, and he called a goddamn dentist. Because if you can't fucking catch criminals with the police, well, it's time to get a dentist involved. No, no, no one... No one makes a better apprehender than a dentist. Uh, well, they, sw- they swear in a couple new deputies, uh, locate every farmer or storekeeper uh, who owns a fucking pistol, surrounds the campsite, which was vacant for the moment, uh, and they take up their, their positions in nearby bushes, hide out by late afternoon. The two bullet-riddled cars return to the campsite. The posse uh, remains in the bushes, surveying their prey. WD is busy inspecting the damage to the vehicles while Clyde is meticulously cleaning their weapons. Plans have been made to return the dying Buck Barrow again back to their mom in Dallas. Uh, they throw caution to the wind. They make a campfire. And while Dee is cooking some sausages, Bonnie's brewing some coffee. Gunfire erupts from the bushes surrounding the camp. Bonnie screams. Every one of them starts grabbing for their weapons. Uh, even Blanche, uh, who usually was not uh, one of the trigger people. When they begin to assemble uh, near the cars, Clyde jumps behind the wheel of one of them, puts it into gear. He begins to drive to the car to where the others have been waiting. Just then, a bullet strikes him in the arm, causing him to drive uh, into a tree stump. With the car disabled, Clyde and W.D. Jones advance to the other car, only to see it reduced to rubble by the onslaught of Posse Wind's gunfire. Buck receives a total of five gunshot wounds to his back. Five more shots. He's already fucking has an open head wound. He drops to the ground. Blanche has refused to leave his side. Now that both cars are eliminated as a means of escape, Buck and Blanche unable to flee. Clyde, Bonnie, and W.D. make tracks to the woods nearby. And remember, Bonnie's running with fucking torn up, you know, scabs from her horribly burned legs. Meanwhile, Clyde's limping along with the, missing those two toes. It's quite a, quite a sight, I'm imagining. Uh, as the lawmen close in, Blanche, holding on to her husband, begins to cry out to them, Stop, don't shoot, he's already dying. Uh, grabbing her by the arms, they pull her away from Buck's side, and Buck just lays there helplessly in a heap and does uh, die soon. And, but the other ones get away. Again, how the fuck do these people constantly get away? They're on foot now. They're on foot. One of them has all messed up, burnt legs. The other one's uh, old, old fucking Clyde three-toe. Uh, old sloth, he can't be. He can't be setting any land speed records. How fuck? How terrible were posse's back then? Oh man, I need a time machine if I want to be a criminal and head back to the early thirties. Uh, and then again, yeah, July 29, 33, Buck does, uh, Barrow does die. We talked about that in his last words to the doctor, or one of the last words earlier. 
Uh, and then the gang takes another hit that summer when member Raymond Hamilton is captured, sentenced to a total of 263 years in prison. So he's going to have to have a, live a long time to beat that. Uh, for various crimes he's committed with Bonnie and Clyde, he gets transferred then to the Eastham Prison Farm. Remember, we've heard about that, north of Huntsville, Texas, the same one Clyde had been raped in. Uh, and it turns out that prison is going to fuck Clyde twice. More on that in a bit. November 15th, 1933, W.D. Jones uh, is arrested in Houston, Texas, and gets that murder without malice charge I mentioned earlier. His time with the gang is over. On November 22nd, 1933, uh, the rest of the gang nearly evades arrest while trying to hook up with family members in East Sowers, Texas. Their hometown sheriff, Dallas Smoot Schmid. Seriously, Dallas is Schmoot Schmid. S-M-O-O-T-S-C-H-M-I-D. What a terrible name. No wonder he became a sheriff. He just fucking mercilessly picked on his entire life. He's, I'll show you when I'm sheriff, no one will be smudged. The name of Smoot Schmid. Fuck. <laughs> your last name is Schmid, and your parents are going to name you Smoot? What in the fuck? Anyway, old Schmoot, old Schmoot Schmid. Uh, it sounds like a piece of shit. It sounds like a type of shit. Like, what do you got on your shoe there? Ah, I got some Schmoot Schmid. Got some Schmoot Schmid on there. Back my shoe. Well, take it off. Don't stink up the house with it. You clean that schmoochman off your shoe before you get in here. Old Schmoochman and his squad, deputies Bob Alcorn and Ted Hinton, people with normal, respectable names, laying wait nearby. As Barrow uh, drove up, he sensed a trap and drove past his family's car, at which point Schmid, old Schmoochman, and his deputies uh, stood up and opened fire with machine guns, and, uh, and, uh, and the family members in the crossfire not hit, but a bullet passed through the car, striking the legs of both Bar <laughs> Barrow and Barker. So both Bonnie and Clyde get shot in the legs. They're already fucking limping around. Now they got shot in the leg. Uh, but th then they still escape. They still escape. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I mean, I mean, were they really that good at being criminals or were the police chasing them just that terrible? How many times did two people, two crippled people, slip out in a hail of gunfire and drive away? Man, being a cop in the days before CBs, you know, CB radios, cell phones, must have been a motherfucker. You can't call anyone for backup. You can't tell anyone where the suspects are headed. You just, you know, you form a posse, you head over to the hideout, you know, you shoot a bunch of bullets, and I guess you just kind of hope for the best. Well, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, they, they, they take making a mockery of authorities to another level to kick off 1934. On January 16, 1934, Clyde Barrow enacts some revenge against the Eastham Prison Farm, where gang member Raymond Hamilton is currently incarcerated. This successful attack on the prison would mark the beginning of the end of their crime spree. Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow sat in their Ford VA coupe on a quiet Texas country road on Saturday evening, January 13, 1934. They were waiting for Floyd Hamilton and an ex-convict named Jimmy Mullins to return. The two men had slipped through the barbed wire perimeter surrounding Eastham Prison Farm. Because again, uh, fucking law enforcement authorities, fucking top-notch back then, uh, to hide an old inner tube beneath a drainage culvert near the prison's camp. Uh, prison's Camp 1. Inside the tube were two Colt 45 automatics and several clips of ammunition placed there in preparation for a jailbreak planned for January 16. At one point, the camp dogs start howling and barking in their kennels, but the camp, uh, guards pay no attention. Uh, of course they don't. Of course they don't pay attention. I feel like the qualification to become a law enforcement officer in the early 30s was like, uh, did, were you, did, you, did, did you stop going to school in the first grade? Because uh, the drawings were too hard. Uh, yes, why are you asking me that? Because that's what it takes. That's what we're looking for. People who have zero education or talent. <laughs> God. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they ignore the dogs. Uh, uh, and then Hamilton and Mullins rejoined Bonnie and Clyde a few minutes later. Uh, Barrow then drove to Dallas and drops off Hamilton, but he kept Mullins in the car so he could keep an eye on him. Floyd and Hamilton returned to Easton the following day. Uh, for a regular uh, bi-weekly bi visit with his younger brother, Raymond, who was serving time for auto theft, armed robbery, and murder. During that visit, uh, Floyd filled Raymond in on the details of the proposed prison break. He probably just fucking, like, got out a whiteboard. That's probably how just checked out these people were. So, all right, pay attention. Pay attention. Uh, hey, prison guards, you care if I put this giant whiteboard? I'm trying to figure out how to escape, uh, how to get my brother out, and I just want to, I just need some space. I just, I, I'm just going to loudly talk about the prison escape attempt. Is that okay? No, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, you, you guys, that's great. I'll get some markers. I got some markers for you. Okay. So, uh, on Monday, an inmate named Aubrey Skelly set out to retrieve the weapon. Skelly was a building tender, a trusty position that allowed him to move about the prison with a certain amount of freedom. Uh, he managed to smuggle the inner tube into the Camp One dormitory and deliver it to Joe Palmer. Palmer, serving 25 years for robbery, hid the inner tube and its contents in his mattress. 
Uh-huh. Uh, other sources, again, would swear that the guns were hidden in one of the brush piles. Uh, that the East of them work squads were to clear the next day. So they hit them somewhere. Uh, would, would the uh, word that the break would take place the following morning reach the two other prisoners who would take part, Henry Methvin, serving 10 years for robbery, an attempted murder, and a killer named Hilton uh, Bibby. Well, Tuesday, January 16th, 1934, it was a damp and chilly morning. Th- thick fog raising from the nearby Trinity River, blanket in the countryside south of Camp One, Parker, Barrow, Mullins, wait in a thickly wooded area on the edge of a country road. By the dim, filtered light of the early morn, they could see a clearing in the trees to the north just beyond a creek that cut across the road. Barrow and Mullins got out of the car, walked toward the clearing. Parker stayed in the vehicle. Barrow carried a Browning automatic rifle capable of firing a 20 round clip of 30. Uh, point, uh, six, uh, zero six armor piercing shells in less than three seconds. Damn. The two men crouched along the creek bank and waited through the morning haze. Uh, they detected movement followed by voices and the sounds of tools and horses. Two work crews of prisoners combined because of staff shortages slowly moved toward Barrow and Mullins spreading out and getting down to the business of clearing the brush piles in preparation for spring planting and cutting wood to stoke the camp stoves. Among the workers were Hamilton and Palmer, both of them armed and dangerous, and both of them aware of who was waiting not far away, Bonnie and Clyde. And now the prison break is about to begin. The routine at Eastham was that a group of guards collectively called the shotgun ring oversaw each work squad, while a long-armed man, uh, a guard on horseback armed with a high-powered rifle, positioned himself at a distance from the detail. According to the instructions of Colonel Lee Simmons, general manager of the Texas prison system, the mounted guard had no duty except to stay well clear of the convicts and be in the background ready with his Winchester in case of excitement. Uh, should a convict break past the shotgun ring, the long-armed man would pick him off. That's the way it's supposed to work. Well, prisoners Raymond Hamilton and Joe Palmer knew that one of Eastham's most uh, more notorious long-armed men, Major Crons- Crownson, uh, uh, routinely disregarded this policy. Crownson had a reputation for leaving his post to beat prisoners. Well, that's that's fun. That's uh, that's that's doing a good job. In fact, Palmer had once received a severe beating from him. Uh, well, in the morning of the prison break, Raymond Hamilton jumped squads, meaning he left his 16-man work crew, joined the crew that included Palmer, Bibby, and Methvin. Uh, guard Olin Bozeman, assigned to Palmer's squad, noticed Hamilton's presence even before the inmates started for the fields from Camp 1. Hamilton and Palmer suspected uh, that would happen, but figured Bozeman would delay taking any action until he was in the field. Uh, again, because these guys are the cream of the crop. Once there, out of earshot of the main camp, he would probably summon Krausen to help him deal with Hamilton. Sure enough, Bozeman called Krausen over as soon as the work crews arrived in the field. As the two guards conversed, Palmer strode up, strolled up to them as if he wanted to ask a question. Instead, he pulled out a weapon and he said, don't you boys try to do anything. Well, there are conflicting reports about what happened next. Some witnesses say Palmer deliberately shot Krausen for revenge. Others claim Krausen fired the first shot. Another source quoted Palmer as saying, I told the guards to sit still, don't move, and there won't be no shooting. I really thought the guards would stick their hands up. Regardless, at some point, Palmer shot Krausen in the stomach. Uh, mortally wounded, the guard turned his horse around and rode back to Camp 1 to sound the alarm. Palmer then fired a Bozeman but missed. Bozeman pulled a pistol and returned fire. Uh, but, uh, it didn't do much good because this whole time these prison guards have been using squirt guns and that's why they're not good. The police, uh, and prison guards, most of the time in the early 1930s and late 1920s used squirt guns. And that's why they, uh, they stopped doing that later because they found it to be very ineffective. No, but that's what it feels like sometimes in the story. No, he, he, he shoots, he returns fire, but his bullet only creased Palmer's temple. Palmer fires again. This time the bullet strikes Bozeman's holstered shotgun and then slices deep into his hip. Bozeman and his mangled weapon fall to the ground. Meanwhile, Raymond Hamilton was fumbling around in the mud in the excitement he'd actually ejected the clip from his own weapon. At that point, Clyde Barrow, still concealed in the nearby creek, stands up and fires a volley from his automatic rifle over the heads of everyone in the field. Guards and prisoners alike dive for cover. Back in the car, Bonnie Parker leans on the horn to signal the escaping men. Palmer, Hamilton, Methvin, and Bibby began running south towards the sound. Two guards uh, run away, completely deserting their posts. Uh, (laughs) And they desert Bozeman. Of course they do. Uh, They were found later hiding 500 yards from their squads. Uh, only one guard, Bobby Ballard, uh, stood his ground, uh, perhaps preventing a mass escape. He says the first man to raise his head will have it blown clear off. Nevertheless, one other convict does manage to flee. J.B. French, serving time for robbery, attempted murder, auto theft, ducks into the underbrush until things quieted down, uh, slips into the woods later. Guards recaptured him sl- shortly after midnight. French knew nothing of the escape plan, didn't even meet those responsible for his brief taste of freedom. Uh, Police later recovered the escape car from a a ravine 10 miles northeast of Hugo, Oklahoma, shortly after the robbery of a nearby filling station. By then, Krausen has died from his wound, and state officials were publicly questioning the prudence of placing convicts like Raymond Hamilton and the other escapees on a prison farm so accessible to the likes of Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, They were also starting to question uh, hiring uh, the worst employees in the history of jobs. Uh, 
Lee Simmons, uh, profoundly embarrassed by the raid, responded by firing uh, two Eastham guards who fled under fire. So I guess they do fire some people. If you just blatantly just um, go hide when an escape attempt breaks out, that's how you get fired. Uh, he also told the dying Major Krausen that he would be resettling accounts. These fellows had their day. We'll have ours. I promise I won't let them get away with it. Well, it didn't take officials long to decide that Bonnie and Clyde were behind the break. It's just a natural conclusion uh, that it was Raymond Hamilton's former partner, said Simmons. And if Barrow was there, and Bonnie, Bonnie must not have been that far away. Well, Raymond Hamilton and Joe Palmer were recaptured separately and returned to prison. Palmer was tried and convicted of the murder of Major Krausen. Hamilton was tried as a habitual criminal, and both men were sentenced to death. And on May 10th, 1935, they die in the electric chair. Uh, separate, you know, separate uh, uh, shockings. That would be kind of, uh, that would be actually uh, weirdly awesome. If they were forced, <laughs> if they were forced to sit together in the electric chair, just the way it reads on May 10th, 1935, they die in the electric chair. That'd be uh, uh, so demeaning to the one guy. Just a little extra shame at the end. Uh, okay, Raymond Hamilton, you're going to sit in the chair. Uh, Joe Palmer, you're going to sit on his lap, you son of a bitch. We're going to fry you both at the same time. Uh, Jimmy Mullins was the state's key witness against Palmer and Hamilton and received immunity from prosecution. Uh, but in 1938, a judge sentenced him to 75 years in prison for a $36 holdup. And so nobody in the end really gets uh, gets away with this stuff. Floyd Hamilton received two years in Leavenworth uh, prison for harboring Bonnie and Clyde. After his release, he embarked on a bank robbing spree, and in 1938, police captured him in Dallas. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to 55 years in prison. 1940, transferred to Alcatraz, where he tried to escape. Uh, that attempt got him nine years in solitary confinement. And then 1958, uh, after being incarcerated for 20 years, uh, he does get released. So these sentences are so crazy compared to the, how long they serve. But we're going to sentence you to 1,000 years in prison. Uh, you'll be out in two. Uh, for Bonnie and Clyde, the Eastham prison break yeah, really did mean the beginning of the end, though, because now they got a lot of extra heat on them. Uh, February 1st, 1934, 17 days after Krausen's death, Simmons meets with Frank Hamer, a tough 49-year-old retired Texas Ranger, and says, I want you to put Clyde and Bonnie on the spot and shoot everyone in sight. Simmons then tells the ex lawman he had been commissioned now as a state highway patrolman, and Hamer took to the road within 10 days. Before long, he's on his way to Louisiana, where Henry Methvin's parents, the recently broke out guy, the newest member of the gang, uh, they live. There, Hamer meets uh, with local sheriff Henderson Jordan. The sheriff tells Hamer that an intermediary named John Joyner had approached him on about March 1st to let him know that in exchange for a pardon from the state of Texas, Henry Methvin would deliver Bonnie and Clyde to the authorities. Sheriff Jordan soon delivers a pardon then uh, agreement to Joyner. And now, for the final days of Bonnie and Clyde, let's hop out of this time suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. All right, I want to talk about Frank Hamer, the man who would finally bring down Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, this dude was about as fucking tough as they come. Uh, but first, I want to talk about some morons. I want to talk about a new segment I'm very excited to introduce. As I research all these topics, topics, I inevitably come across posts that feature comment sections, you know, the message board threads, uh, YouTube videos, their own set of comments, you know, et cetera. And I'm continually amazed by the words and sentence fragments that uh, other people reading the same articles and watching the same videos feel compelled to write because their voices must be heard. And I laugh my ass off. And then just finally, you know, I, I realize why am I not sharing the best of what I find? You know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it. Why am I not giving it to the time suckers? What a great way to introduce a little comic relief into some of our heavier subjects. And so, you know, here we go with the very first Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. 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 Okay, first up, insane conspiracy theorist Francis Goldstein, who left the following comment on a Bonnie and Clyde YouTube video seven months ago. He says, Bonnie and Clyde are fake. PSYOP to pass National Firearms Act and nationalizing police FBI. All the photos are fake and staged. They never robbed a bank or shot anyone. They are just actors, actress. No part of the story is true. It is a completely fairy tale. Okay. Uh, interesting uh, word choices and grammar there. Uh, look, if you listen to my JFK episode, you know I'm not opposed to a conspiracy theory, but good God, Francis. Bonnie and Clyde never existed. Uh, what next? The earth is flat? That there's an ice wall around it? NASA guards? You know, this ice wall to keep us from discovering that the moon landing was fake. The moon is full of space lizards monitoring our thoughts, monitoring our thoughts. Reel, reel it back in, buddy. Reel it back in. You know, whenever, like, you come across something like the like that lizard Illuminati theory and you're wondering, like, who fucking believes this shit? Or, like, flat earth. Like, what? Well, how would anyone believe this? You read comments like this and you're like, oh, people like this Francis uh, <laughs> Goldstein character. Okay, next we have Robert Conkle, who used uh, the comment section of a Bonnie and Clyde crime reenactment video to express his rage against the Clintons five months ago. He, 
just totally out of context here. It was to think of what Bonnie and Clyde did, to think about how they were ambushed for their crimes, and me wonders, me wonders, uh, me wonders how the Clinton, how the Clinton have gotten away with so much, including serial killings, crimes against humanity, drug trafficking, and treason against the United States. Wow. Uh, again, really interesting grammar. I love it. I love it. Uh, how the Clinton singular have gotten away with so much and how uh, against the United States is his own sentence. Uh, really, really shoehorn that in that comment section. It makes me wonder how many other places old Bob Conkle is expressing his political opinions. You know, I'm sure we could find him across some other videos. Just to think of what Ursula did to Ariel, to think of how she was tricked. And me wonders how Hillary Clinton was allowed to trick American people with her trickery emails. Ariel almost died, lost her voice forever. Hillary Clinton should be silenced with her voice for treason, child trafficking, cocaine manufacturing, weapons building, Illuminati sacrifices. To think of what Michael Jordan did to Craig Elo. To think he made him look like a fool with game-winning shot. And me wonders how many babies Hillary Clinton has shot. How has Clinton got away with so many rapings of families and families' pets, so many crimes as this is, including selling Christian souls to demons, making Prophet Alex Jones cry, taking last ketchup packet at Wendy's, forcing me to eat dry fries? And finally, uh, my favorite. Uh, this is a comment left under an article about, uh, uh, <laughs> about the car that, that Bonnie and Clyde died in being replicated and sold under uh, the pretense of it being authentic. Uh, a little controversy. People are some, selling some fake Bonnie and Clyde death cars. And... Uh, uh, Pinocchio says on March 28th, 19, uh, 2014, uh, 9.51 a.m., he says, they knew they were going to die like the rest of us when and how. So here's why I'm amazed by this person. How are they able to read an article? Because this, is, this isn't a video. How are they able to read an article but not be able to write out one single coherent sentence? They knew we going to die. You know, maybe they meant they knew we were going to die or they knew they were going to die. Uh, I could follow that uh, if it was, you know, they knew they were going to die. But then they go on to say, like the rest of us, when and how. Does that mean the rest of us know when we're going to die and how? I don't have the answer to either of those questions. I don't think Pinocchio has either of those answers, to be honest. Uh, I don't think Pinocchio knows how to spell the word answer. Because instead of instead of spelling Pinocchio as P-I-N-O-C-C-H-I-O, uh, he spelled it as P-I-N-O-K-E-E-O. -E -E Dude, you're already on the internet. Look it up on Google. Google will fix it for you, just like it did for me when I realized I didn't know how to spell Pinocchio. Education is important, everybody. It's part of why we suck, isn't it? And why I don't believe a Time Suckers comment will ever be featured in this new segment. Idiots of the internet. 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 All right, back to Frank Hamer. Hank, Hamer was a Texas Ranger. Uh, who'd been in roughly 50 gun battles, killed around a dozen men, he saved African Americans from KKK lynch mobs in Texas, battled arms and drug dealers in the Mexican border, along with a handful of other Texas Rangers, once protected a black rape suspect from a mob of 6,000 enraged rednecks in Sherman, Texas. The man is the personification of fucking bravery, and we will dig into him further in an upcoming Texas Ranger time suck I'm excited about. And now in early 1934, he'd come out of retirement to bring down Bonnie and Clyde. How fucking cool is that? Old badass coming out of retirement to put away one last set of bad guys? Who do you think he was? Clint Eastwood? Uh, after the killing of two state troopers on Easter Sunday, the nation's romantic obsession with the killers is also over, and they want Frank to gun him down. Uh, Fort Worth Bay State Troopers H.D. Murphy and Edward Wheeler were killed on April 1st, 1934, when thinking a motorist needed assistance, they surprised Bonnie and Clyde and the gang member Meth, uh, Henry Methvin, who were waiting for an Easter Sunday meeting with family members. Witnesses said Methvin panicked and shot Wheeler. Then Barrow uh, shot Murphy, whose bullets were still in his pocket. According to the South Lake Historical Society, a farmer living nearby who had been sitting on his porch was a witness to the shootings and provided information to help identify the killers. Well, the public forgave a lot of bad deeds Bonnie and Clyde did, but killing two police officers uh, on Easter Sunday was too damn much. And then on May 21st, gang member Henry Methvin's father, Ivan, put a plan together with Frank Hamer in exchange for a lighter sentence for his son. Henry Methvin would find some pretext to part company with Bonnie and Clyde, knowing that the outlaws would plan to rejoin him at his parents' home. Hamer and five other law enforcement officers would hide by the side of the graded road leading to Methvin's house and wait for Bonnie and Clyde to drive up. After two days of waiting, on May 23rd, 1934, at about 9, 10 a.m., Hamer's team uh, heard the steady roar of rapidly a rapidly moving vehicle. They knew that only Clyde Barrow would hurtle along along a country road at such a speed. As the tan Ford V8 sedan approached, Bob Alcorn, the only officer who could identify Barrow on site, called out quietly, it's him, boys. This is it. This is Clyde. Uh, 
As added insurance, Henry's father also signals his recognition of fugitives. Of the fugitives, uh, the officers opened up with the deadly fusillade when bat when the uh, shooting stopped. Bonnie and Clyde were dead. And they've been shot a total of nearly fifty times. An Oklahoma court later tried and sentenced Methvin to death uh, for the killing of police officer Cal Campbell, a murder Methvin committed after making the pardon agreement. The court commuted his sentence to life, however, when officials disclosed Methvin's part in Bonnie and Clyde's ambush. In April 1949, after Methvin's release from prison, an unknown person knocked him unconscious and placed him on a Louisiana railroad track where a passing train cut him in half. Every single member of the Barrow gang eventually met a violent death, except for brief member Blanche Barrow, who would remain friends with Bonnie's sister, Billy, uh, for the rest of her life, eventually dying of cancer at the age of 77. So that is the tale of Bonnie and Clyde. But before I get my final thoughts on the duel and hit our top five takeaways, I, I want to read you a letter written by Clyde Barrow the month before he died, and then also a poem written by Bonnie Parker about a year before uh, she, she died. I find both of them really fascinating and just interesting kind of tells about their character. Uh, this is this is that letter uh, from Clyde, who wrote it to Henry Ford, the automobile maker. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 10th April. Mr. Henry Ford, Detroit, Michigan. Dear Sir, while I still have got breath in my lungs, I will tell you what a dandy car you make. I have drove Fords exclusively when I could get away with one. For sustained speed and freedom from trouble, the Ford has got ever every other car skinned, and even if my business hasn't been strictly legal... It don't hurt anything to tell you what a fine car you got in the V8. Yours truly, Clyde Champion Barrow. I love how he adds champion to his middle name. What a fucking nut. That really cracks me up, man. The dude's been on the run from the law for years. His brother's recently killed by the police. His girl's been burned and shot recently. He's been shot recently. Yet he still feels it's important to take a little moment and send Henry Ford a thank you letter for all the good times he's had fleeing from the police and the Ford cars he's stolen. And strange as this letter was, I mean, could you get a better endorsement? Ford cars had kept the wanted man free for several years. And now check out this poem from Bonnie. We learned earlier that she, she was good at poetry. It really shows how uh, kind of self-aware she was, just aware of their situation. Impressive for somebody so young. You know, if there's one thing criminals just don't do anymore. It's, it's write poems. Uh, this one's called The Trail's End. You've read the story of Jesse James, of how he lived and died. If you're still in need of something to read, here's the story of Bonnie and Clyde. Now, Bonnie and Clyde are the Barrow Gang. I'm sure you all have read. How they rob and steal, and those who squeal are usually found dying or dead. There's lots of untruths to these write-ups. They're not as ruthless as that. Their nature is raw. They hate all the law, the stool pigeons, spotters, and rats. They call them cold-blooded killers. They say they are heartless and mean. But I say this with pride that I once knew Clyde when he was honest and upright and clean. But the law fooled around, kept taking him down and locking him up in his cell. Till he said to me, I'll never be free, so I'll meet a few of them in hell. The road was so dimly lighted, there were no highway signs to guide. But they made up their minds, if all roads were blind, they wouldn't give up till they died. The road gets dimmer and dimmer, sometimes you can hardly see. But it's fight man to man and do all you can, for they know they can never be free. From heartbreak some people have suffered, from weariness some people have died. But take it all in all, our troubles are small, till we get like Bonnie and Clyde. If a policeman is killed in Dallas, and they have no clue or guide, if they can't find a fiend, they just wipe their slate clean and hang it on Bonnie and Clyde. There's two crimes committed in America, not a credit to the Barrow mob. They had no hand in the kidnapped a man nor the Kansas City Depot job. A newsboy once said to his buddy, I wish old Clyde would get jumped. In these awful hard times, we'd make a few dimes if five or six cops would get bumped. The police haven't got the report yet, but Clyde called me up today. He said, don't start any fights. We aren't working nights. We're joining the NRA. From Irving to West Dallas Viaduct is known as the Great Divide, where the women are kin and the men are men, and they won't stool on Bonnie and Clyde. If they try to act like citizens and rent them a nice little flat, about the third night they're invited to fight by a subgun's rat-tat-tat. They don't think they're too smart or desperate. They know that the law always wins. They've been shot at before, but they do not ignore that death is the wages of sin. Someday they'll go down together. They'll bury them side by side. To feel will be grief to the law of relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. Man, I get the fascination with Bonnie and Clyde. You know, that poem was widely distributed by, by the press and, and the pictures of them kind of hanging out at their hideouts. You know, it's just, I, I understand the romantic uh, fascination when you read that. You know, it was just two kind of, you know, poor, poor kids who felt they'd been fucked over by the justice system and they were getting a little revenge. Now, that doesn't justify what they did, but I understand kind of people relating to that. 
You know, I feel like the collateral damage robbers account for, it just doesn't truly uh, accrue the same moral judgment that other, you know, murders and, and different crimes endure. And again, I'm not advocating robbery, especially armed robbery, but when you think of a robber, especially a bank robber, it's very different than thinking about like a serial killer, right? They're very different than thinking about like a rapist or that, that type of criminal. You know, th those two seem like monsters to most of us. Committing crimes would be morally incapable of, but come on, who hasn't daydreamed at least once, at least once when you were a kid about robbing a bank? I sure have. I bet it's a common fantasy, especially among the working class. Maybe if you're born rich and you don't you think about it, you know, because you already got all the money you need. Robbing, especially bank robbing, captivates the imagination like few other crimes, especially when you're poor. And when you're poor, I think it's easy to see the banks as part of the elite, part of the enemy in a way. Especially when you're hearing about it on the news, you know, white-collar criminals consistently going unpunished for fucking over the poor. You're hearing about bank bailouts. I mean, think about that in our time. $700 billion in taxpayer money just given to the bank industry in the 2008 uh, Troubled Asset Relief Program to solve a problem they created. Yep, you know, meanwhile, nobody gets their uh, house given back to them when they can't pay their mortgage bills. You know, how fucked up is that? You know, the common citizen doesn't get bailout money. To me, it felt like they stole $700 billion from the, the citizenry, you know? And then, you know, meanwhile, m people are losing their homes left and right. You know, putting on a ski mask, grabbing a shotgun, taking a little back feels somehow morally justified in some situations. Well, think about how people must have felt in the few years after the stock market crash of the Great Depression. By 1933, nearly half of America's banks had failed and the unemployment was approaching 15 million people or 30% of the workforce, and no one got fucked over more than working class families in the Depression. Sure, the elite may have lost some summer homes, in some cases everything, but a lot of the poor lost everything, lost their farms, like Clyde had growing up. You know, Bonnie lost her dad and then grew up in, you know, you know poverty. She lost her job uh, at a cafe shortly before meeting Clyde, lost her husband to jail. 1930, when the two met, you know, I'm sure the future felt pretty fucking bleak. And that doesn't justify shooting up, you know, banks and gas stations. I know that, but there's something darkly admirable about people who just don't lie down and take it when life starts fucking them. I mean, isn't there? I mean, I think the public was fascinated by them in part because they were brave enough to fight back in their way, to do what a lot of other people probably wanted to do but weren't willing to go to prison for. And then when you hear that poem and you realize just how aware they were, their situation, and they knew they were going to die, there's just something darkly, you know, tragically beautiful about that. Uh, rather than just live a long life full of almost a, you know, inevitable hardship and poverty, they were just going to live fast and fun and then die young. And adding to the fascination, I think, is the young love angle. There's something so special about young love, so all-encompassing. You don't lose your head in the same way as you get older with love. You know, you can love someone more deeply, appreciate them more maturely and fully as you get older, but, you know, that mature form of love doesn't have that fuck everybody, fuck the world kind of sense to it. You know, that that other person is the only person that matters. I'm going to fuck their brains out and fuck away the world. You know, that kind of fiery love, you know, you have when you're young. It's so powerful, so full of lust and living in the moment. And whether you actually have it or not, Bonnie and Clyde, or whether they had it or not, Bonnie and Clyde were perceived to have it. Imagine you're a regular old citizen back then. It's 1933 or 34. You're working two jobs to barely feed your skinny, dirty kids. You can't find work. Your husband can't find work. You're sitting at an old beat-up table in an unconditioned, you know, or unair-conditioned home, sweltering in the summer heat, freezing maybe in the winter because you can't pay the gas bill, staring silently across the table at your husband or wife, all dead-eyed, a man or woman you have nothing to talk about, nothing new to discuss, someone as depressed as yourself about the numbing prospect that your future may be even worse than their present, and then you hear about Bonnie and Clyde. Robin Banks, fucking in hideouts, sticking to the man. They must have seemed so goddamn alive. And I think what made them appealing is that they were attractive. It's not like Bonnie uh, had a unibrow or cankles poking out from under her muumuu, or that Clyde, you know, showed up in photos with a big fat gut spilling over his sweatpants, a little bit of sausage gravy and his unkept beard. Now Bonnie was a little thing, standing only 4'11", weighing 90 pounds. She had strawberry blonde curls, cute as hell, fashionable. You know, looking at her picture, beauty pops out right away. Clyde was boyishly handsome, dimpled cheeks, strong jawline, great hair, looking dapper as fuck in those suits. You know, they were young, good looking, driving fast cars, wearing expensive clothes, and they didn't give a shit about the law or what you thought. Again, I get the fascination. And finally, I get it when you take into the revenge angle with Clyde. Dude was raped in prison, mistreated by the prison officials, beat by the guards. He wanted some revenge. Who can't admire that on some level? You know, neither one of them should have did what they did. You know, Clyde killed, you know, people who, uh, he killed a guy who wronged him in prison. Probably should have stopped there with his killing. You know, and Bonnie, even though she personally didn't kill anybody, no one thinks she actually ever pulled the trigger in one of these crimes. She had no business being along for the ride and driving the getaway car, but she did. You know, she rode with Clyde to the bitter end, rode with him through death, pain, prison lockups, breakouts, fire, and bullets, and then died with him, knowing that's how it all would, would end. You know, and again, what they did wasn't right, terribly wrong, but I get why we're still talking about them. And, and I mean, and, and also, you know, who, who wouldn't want to be loved how Bonnie loved Clyde, right? Yeah, I get it. And I get that it's time now for some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. 
Number one, Bonnie smuggled a gun into prison for Clyde, a man she'd met only a few weeks before, and he used it to successfully break out of prison. Try and top that with a how do you know they were the one for you relationship story. Number two, Buck Barrow got shot in the head in a police shootout, leaving him with part of his brain exposed, and he still fled and lived to fight in another shootout where he was shot again and still didn't die for several days. Whenever I think I'm tough, I like to read about stuff like that. I like to read about men like Buck and put myself in my place. Number three, uh, Clyde Barrow escaped from prison, broke others out of prison on a separate occasion, and got away from the cops in about 10 consecutive shootouts, but still got shot to death at the age of 25. Good lesson to learn there. Gamble enough with your life, and the house is bound to win. Number four, Bonnie Parker's dad fell off a scaffold and died when she was a little kid, and then she married a criminal who went to jail and ended up getting shot to death by prison guards, and then she broke another dude out of jail who ended up getting shot by police officers and got herself killed as well. So dads, if you're listening to the show right now, uh, if you want your daughter to fuck a bunch of criminals and die in a shootout, well, just go ahead and fall off one of those scaffolds. Or be careful and raise a right. And number five, some new information. Bonnie and Clyde's bullet-riddled death car is on display at a Nevada casino. Following the ambush of Bonnie and Clyde, a Louisiana sheriff who is a member of Hamer's six-man posse claimed the pockmarked Ford V8 sedan still coated with the outlaw's blood and gore. Uh, but a federal judge ruled that the automobile stolen by Bonnie and Clyde should return to its former owner, Ruth Warren of Topeka, Kansas. Warren leased and eventually sold the car to Charles Stanley, an anti-crime lecturer who toured fairgrounds with the death car and the mothers of Bonnie and Clyde in tow as sideshow attractions. Still speckled with bullet holes, the death car is now an attraction in the lobby of the Whiskey Pete's Casino in Prim, Nevada, a small resort town on the California border, 40 miles south of Las Vegas. Finally, one and only one reason to go to Whiskey Pete's. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Well, thanks, suckheads, for listening to some Bonnie and Clyde this week. Can't believe how long it took for those two to get caught. Oh, wow. Uh, thanks to everyone who came out to Orlando uh, at the improv this past week. Man, so great. All you time suckers and BDMs had a great time. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts as well, Mediocre Time with Tom and Dan. You can listen to that episode and all their others by going to TomandDan.com. And you can listen to me on several other podcasts coming up in the next week or so. The Gallows uh, Humor Podcast, that's the Gallows Humor Podcast, the Burn It Down Podcast, and the Living Podcariously Podcast, all available uh, to listen on iTunes or wherever uh, podcasts are downloaded. And I'll be at Hyenas Comedy Club in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, June 22nd through 24th. Another great club I love performing at. Uh, be sure to follow Time Suck on social media, at Time Suck Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, uh, slash Time Suck Podcast on Facebook, or backslash Time Suck Podcast. Uh, this Friday, you can hear a preview of next Monday's Time Sucks if you follow Time Suck on social media. And you can spread the suck by sharing it. Next week, we are sucking on Nostradamus and Prophecies of the Apocalypse. Could that 16th century son of a bitch really see the future? Did that French jackalope really have mystical powers? Or was that European necromancer just another manipulative, misunderstood, misguided fucking Tony Robbins charlatan? And who else has been predicting Armageddon, right? Could any of them be right? Why are so many people so eager for the world to end with apocalypse prophecies? Man, if you're ready to go, just take yourself out. Why do the rest of us have to come with you, you selfish maniac? So excited to look into uh, some uh, apocalyptic prophetic history. Uh, it's going to be some interesting shit we're going to be talking about uh, next Monday. So tune in. Tell your friends to do the same. Tell your enemies to go fuck themselves. And I've said it before, and I hope to say it a thousand more times. Keep on sucking.